two brief things. So one thing is, um, one comment that I saw in the survey a lot was uh, people asked for recitations in addition to office hours, or maybe TAs go over problems. Um, so maybe once or every other week, uh, TAs would have a session where they explain some topic one more time, you know, and um, go over some example problems. So I thought that's a good idea, and I asked one of the TAs, uh, so you know, one of the PhD TAs to actually do this. Kind of a quick poll: Who would be interested in attending such sessions? <sighs> okay, this is a fair amount. All right, okay, good. So we will do this, and I guess the first session will be on uh, kernels. The second one will be on Gaussian processes, and then probably boosting, and then deep learning, I guess. Uh, one additional thing, so one thing that people said that I thought was very interesting was that uh, one complaint that I also got this actually less in the survey but more at lunch talking to students is that you know this vocarium setup is very neat and uh, in some sense it's all cut out that you just have to do a small portion of the code and the problem is that some students said well I wouldn't really know if I get a data set now how to attack that data set without having a vocarium setup and so um, I thought what we do is we do a competition where I give you a data set and that's all. And you have to basically, it's a training data set with, and you have to submit in the test data set without labels and you have to submit predictions on the test data. And this will be for extra credit. So that's also an opportunity for those who didn't do so well on the exam to kind of bump up their grade. And it will also be a great opportunity for you to kind of do machine learning in the wild, right? So you actually can just do anything you want, just use, pull out all the tricks that you've learned and really make it work, right? Simulate the uh, setting where you just given a data set and now, you know, see what you can do. So uh, we will hopefully push that out by the end of the week, maybe Monday next week. That's the current plan. And this will be a Kaggle hosted competition. Um, any questions about this? Yeah, it will be due on the last day of class. Actually, uh, possibly even on the 17th, so the last day that is possibly due. So you have a lot of time, um, and you know it involves everything, right? PJ preprocessing, you know, you can use SVMs, deep learning, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, is it going to be a uh, regression or discrete class? Oh, it's going to be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Likely discrete classes, actually. <laughs> So we're we still debating. We have like a few data sets that we're discussing right now. Which one are you going to pick? But it, it looks like it will be um, a classification problem. Okay, good. All right, so then last time we uh, still talked about kernels. And in particular, we talked about kernel SVN. So first, actually, we talked about kernel regression. And um, kernel regression, let me just write down, the, you know, we derived this and... Wait, didn't there used to be a... Oh, wow. Okay, I never realized this. So, uh, <clears throat> we talked about kernel regression, and there basically we actually um, came up with the following formula that h of z equals k star um, transpose k inverse times y. So it's, it's very simple. The k star is actually the kernel, um, the k star i is the kernel of xi with the test point z. This here is the kernel matrix kij equals the kernel of xi xj. And um, so you just multiply that with a, uh, with a vector y. So this will come in handy later on. But it was just one example of how to kernelize an algorithm. Then we talked about kernel SVM. In kernel SVM, uh, we kernelized in an unusual way. We took, a, uh, took advantage of a well-known um, fact in optimization, theorem, uh, optimization theory that says if you have a convex uh, minimization problem, uh, then there must be a dual problem, which is a maximization problem. And these two intersect exactly at the solution. So they have exactly the same solution. And it turns out that the dual problem actually 
accesses the, uh, uh, the data points only as inner products. And if we solve the dual problem, it's actually trivial to kernelize it. Um, you just, instead of putting the inner product matrix, you put in a kernel matrix. Um, so it's a very, very elegant way of, of kernelizing the, the SVM algorithm. And this is actually where everything got started. The, just to put the equations out one more time, I'm not going to write down the dual problem. I hope you still have it in front of you. Um, but the, the uh, weight vector at the end becomes um, the sum of all data points times yi times alpha i uh, times phi of xi, where one more time, phi is basically this mapping to really high dimensional space that we never actually compute. But um, as long as we only do inner products with other points, it's, it's correct, it's, it's okay. And then if we actually do a classification of any point z, then what we get is it's the sign of w transpose x, which then becomes yi alpha i k of xi comma z plus b. <clears throat> okay, any questions about SVMs, dual SVMs, before I move on? <clears throat> okay, so kernel SVMs, you know, just by doing, you know, solving the optimization problem and using this here as a, you know, as a classification function, um, it's an ex extremely powerful algorithm. And one thing I want to do today is actually show you, you know, we actually move on today and we talk about Gaussian processes. Um, but I, I want to do five more minutes on SVMs and just show you something kind of neat. Um, so if you, you know, I want to just examine this equation a little bit. So remember, we started out this class with the simplest possible machine learning algorithm, which was the one nearest neighbor, K nearest neighbor classification algorithm, right? And so the K nearest neighbor algorithm, what you do is you take, you know, you will remember this, right? You have data, data like this, and what you do is you have a new test point, you find the K nearest neighbors, and you average the label. So let's say this here plus one, this here is minus one, so you have two times plus one, one times minus one, so that's positive, so that you would give this a positive label. I can write this decision function of the Kanier's neighbor algorithm as the following equation. I can say what we do is for a test point z, we sum over all the training points. And, I'm oh sorry, we do the sign. And so assume for now my, my labels are plus one, minus one. Then I sum over all my training points, and I take the label of that training point uh, if it's a nearest neighbor. So I have this delta function that says if xi is a nearest neighbor of c. Okay, this, any questions about this line? So this is the nearest neighbor assignment rule. So I'm basically saying I'm just summing over all points and in some sense, I'm basically summing up the labels, but I'm only taking those points that are nearest neighbors. So this is either one or the zero, right? So this is one, one if, one if, if uh, xi is a nearest neighbor of z, zero otherwise. That's, that's this function here, right? <clears throat> so in this case, I would basically take one plus one minus one is plus one, so it's actually a positive label, so I assign a positive label. Yeah, question? Oh, that's sign. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Any questions? Now, compare this with this equation here. where we say h of z is the sum of all points, their label times alpha i k plus some bias. Okay? So something should strike you, right? And this is really, really similar. Right? It's, it's almost the same thing. We sum it over all the data points, and here we basically just say, oh, well, let's only take the nearest neighbor. Everything is, you know, on the nearest neighbors are one, everything else is zero. Here we have this term here. Now let's look at this term. Alpha i k of x i z. Now let's just first look at only k of x i z. What is k of x i z? Let's look at the 
Gaussian kernel, the RBF kernel. K of xi z equals e to the minus xi minus z squared over sigma squared. Right? So what does that mean? If z is really far away, so xi is really far away from z, right? then in this case I'm assigning a 0 because it's not a nearest neighbor. In this case, what am I doing? I'm saying xi minus z is really large because they're really far away from each other. e to the minus something really, really large is 0, right? Because it's exponential decay, right? It goes down exponentially to 0. So if points are really, really far, both of these rules, what they say is you just disregard them, right? They don't affect our classification. So we only look at close points. So if xi minus z is small, then e to the minus something small, well, that can be you know, reasonably large still. Right? So what is the SVM doing? It's actually doing the same thing as Kanier's neighbors. It's just not making a hard threshold. It just doesn't say, oh, we take three nearest neighbors. What it does instead, it puts a Gaussian distribution around the test point. This here's my test point. You put a Gaussian distribution around it. This here is my Gaussian distribution. This is kind of like a, a bump that comes out of the, the uh, blackboard. And if you get far away, then this value here is really, really small, so these points don't matter. Right? If they are really, really close, they're very large. And so you basically do an a weighted average of the neighbors. Right? That's basically what it is. So Kanye is so SVM, really what it is, is a soft nearest neighbor algorithm. Where instead of saying you have k nearest neighbors, you say, you know, I, I put a Gaussian around myself, right? And if I would put a Gaussian around me here, right, you guys here would still get some probability mass, right? So I'm basically averaging you guys, but you guys on the way back, you have zeros. You don't, you don't matter anymore. Right? So it's, it's very similar to k nearest neighbors. It's just that I'm not have a hard threshold, uh, uh, a cutoff, instead I have a soft cutoff. That's what the k does. What does the alpha do? Now remember, the alphas are basically, you know, weights that we assign, but there's one thing that's really important. And if you look at the dual of problem, the alphas are always non-negative, right? They're either between zero and C. So what are we doing? We are assigning additional weights to these points. In fact, a lot of them are zero. So what does that mean? That just means we take some training points and just remove them because we don't need them, right? That makes a lot of sense. If you have many points here, right? And there's no other labels. But why do you have to keep all these points? You can just set all of these to zero and just remove them. Right? They're not changing anything. Everything here will be classified as positive. So we can just set them to zero. Right? That's exactly what the SVM is doing. It's, you know, these are the, basically the points that are not support vectors. Those are points that are in a region that gets classified correctly anyway. Just set them to zero. Right? <clears throat> so SVM is in some sense especially with an RBF kernel, a smart nearest neighbor algorithm that does two things. Number one, it takes your train data set and thins it out and removes points that are obvious. Right? And so you don't have to carry your, whole, your entire data set around. All the points that have zero, zero alpha you don't need. And then the second thing is, then for a test point, it basically has some soft assignment where it says, you know, if there's some dense region, I take on more neighbors. If it's a sparse region, I take on fewer neighbors. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah? Yeah, so, so um, in these high dimensional spaces, you typically don't need to kernelize. Right? This is only a property of the kernel. If you don't kernelize anymore, then you just have a linear classifier. Right? Um, the, the RBF kernel does not work so well in, in high, if you, the, the RBF kernel is affected by the curse of dimensionality. Just because everything is far away from everything. Right? That's what happens. <clears throat> so, but the fascinating thing is, right, we started out with the Kenyan's neighbor algorithm. Then we introduced something totally different, right? A linear classifier. Then we mapped that linear classifier into an infinite dimensional space. And what did we get? the k nearest neighbor algorithm. Right? So what we're basically showing is that you know, this, in this infinite dimensional space, actually, a linear classifier is basically doing what a k nearest neighbor algorithm is doing. Right? It's just better, though. Right? SVM is because you're weighing data points you know, by these alphas, and uh, because you have a soft assignment, 
it typically gets, uh, tends to get much lower error than the nearest neighbor. <coughs> the last, last but not least, actually, we also assign a bias. Right? So that's just a, a small detail that you don't really need most of the time. OK, any more questions about SVMs? Yeah. The question is, are there any scenarios in which non-kernelized SVMs are better? And the, the reason is yes. yes. So if you have very high dimensional data, like for example text documents, there's no need for you to kernelize. Right? You just use a linear SVM. Right? Of course, that's identical to a kernel SVM with a linear kernel. Right? <clears throat> yeah, any more questions? OK, good. Um, so then what? Uh, oh, yeah, perfect. OK, good. So let me just hand out next thing. So I have to warn you a little bit. The next topic is not complicated. But students perceive it as complicated. Uh, I don't really know why. Um, I'm trying every year, I'm rewriting that lecture every year for the last, you know, I don't know how many years. And uh, it's one of the most beautiful algorithms, but I'm just warning you, please pay attention now. It's like it's, there's a really high cost if you don't get it the first time. Reading up afterwards is quite tricky. Um, it's, the, the, it's borderline non-trivial. <coughs> Okay. Sorry, I gave too many to the uh, these guys in the front. Okay, but just because, actually, uh, just to wrap this up, let me show you one more time the. Um, okay, this is one more time the SVM demo. Because now that you understand it better, uh, it may make a lot more sense to you. So let me just create a data set. So here's a data set that is not linearly separable. For example, I have a bunch of points around it. And so these are my negative points around the circle. My positive points are in the, in the center. If I now run a linear classifier, this is what the linear classifier tries to do. Right? It basically says, well, here are some positive points. I can put this line here, and I get reasonable error. It doesn't really make all that much sense. It's, it's just, it's, you can't really do it. Um, but here's what the SVM does, right? And um, actually, this is maybe a little bit too large of a C, actually. So in this case, actually, it makes everything support vectors. This is the only point it drops, actually. So it looks like I made my C a little bit too large. Um, if you look at the 3D plot, you can see how it. You know, here it basically carves out this, this valley in the middle, right? And so you can now see how it's a nearest neighbor algorithm, right? It basically, wherever you have this, this a dot here, you see it's very, very red, right? That means it's very positive, right? Around these data points. And this is exactly this Gaussian, Gaussian kernel that you basically put around all these data points. So here it's all, all red, right? So it, it, because you're closest to one of these red points. And then you get in here, and basically in here you have all these blue points. So, you know, again, it's, it's darkest right where you have one of those blue points, right? Uh, so it, you can see it's kind of a smoothed out decision function of the nearest neighbor uh, algorithm. What are the white lines, the contour lines, right? Oh, good point. The white lines are the, the lines where the decision boundary is exactly one. So those are the support vectors.
I can also uh, show you one more demo on. Um, so I also showed this last time. Here we have a, you know, we do a one dimensional plot. This is now our uh, kernel regression. Yeah, and so what you see here is um, there are two parameters. One is the kernel width that basically says when I do my RBF kernel, um, how wide is that Gaussian? Right? So my nearest neighbor algorithm, how, how, how wide does it go? And the other part, the lambda is basically how much do I regularize? <clears throat> and what you see here is this here, right? Um, wait, so, that, so here in this case, basically, it be, it's kind of like a linear classifier because I, I have a very, very, uh, my, my, this is extremely regularized. <clears throat> but this whole thing is very smooth function. This is because my, my sigma is very wide. So I have very wide Gaussians. This means in some sense, what am I doing? I have a nearest neighbor algorithm that averages over many, many points, right? So that changes very little, right? This is a low variance, high bias classifier still, despite that it's kernelized. And if I, ch if I lower my sigma, then these Gaussians become smaller and smaller. And what am I doing? Essentially, basically, I'm, I'm, this is kind of like k nearest neighbor with large k. And this here's k nearest neighbor with very small k, right? So what you see here is that basically right around this data point, it gives a large value, right? But then it falls off already, right? Because you're no longer close to that point. Right? So it really just predicts exactly what your nearest neighbor does. And if you're too far off, well, then you just, it just falls back to the mean, right? So it, it's a very, very sharp. This is a high variance, very high variance, low bias classifier. <laughs> Any questions about kernel regression? Yeah? This is, this is? Rich. This is rich regression, yeah. That's right, lambda and sigma. So lambda is the regularization, and sigma is the kernel width. So this here is the grid, right? So you basically I change my lambda in increasing order to the right. So this is low lambda. If I go to the right, the lambda becomes larger. So I regularize more. So these are all flat lines, because I over-regularize. And as you go down, I'm increasing my sigma. So that basically means I make my Gaussians wider, the kernel wider. So that's kind of equivalent to making a, you know, like if you look at the, if it wasn't SVM, it would be a large K now. Like, you know, uh, sorry, Kenya's neighbor classifier would be a large K now. So you're averaging over many different points. <clears throat> okay, any questions about this? Okay, all right. So, um, all right, here we go. Um, we are not quite done yet with kernels. So the next algorithm actually is still a kernel algorithm. Then, then there's the last kernel algorithm. Um, the next algorithm is called Gaussian processes. And it's basically an extension of um, lin a kernel regression. And I, I always, like, typically my view is that Gaussian processes are kind of the regression equivalent of SVMs. So SVMs are kind of, you know, really good classifiers. If you have classification problem, SVMs are great algorithms. And they give low errors, they're very reliable. They don't really work well for regression. There's, there's many people who've tried to make re SVM regression, and it's awkward. It doesn't really work, right? Because you have this hyperplane, you try to put points on one side and the other, and basically what they do is they say, well, if you're kind of off the hyperplane, I still kind of classify you with the same value. It doesn't really work, it's awkward. Gaussian processes are really good for regression. People have tried to make Gaussian process classification, and that's awkward, and doesn't really work properly. Right? So they're really, kind of, I would say, equal partners. Right? They have very complementary strengths. Um, for Gaussian processes, to get into this, we actually have to think a little bit about Gaussian distributions. And um, Gaussian distribution is a wonderful distribution. And one, the reason why Gaussian processes are so awesome is because they're all based in Gaussian distributions. And Gaussian distributions are just really easy to work with. They have very, very, very nice properties. Um, the first thing is, can anyone tell me anything that's, un that's truly Gaussian distributed? One second, I'm trying to blank this.
Does anyone know anything that's Gaussian distributed? Yeah? Height of people, right, exactly, right? Height of people is something that is Gaussian distributed, right? So in fact, actually, well, height of people is actually not Gaussian distributed, it's, it's uh, bimodal, right? So you have men and women, and, but if you condition, if you say given that you know the gender, it's a Gaussian distribution. Um, actually, I actually have a friend who, who actually uh, wanted to, to show this in this class, right? And he uh, collected some data. And he thought, where can I get data? I just want to show my, my students that humans really have a Gaussian distribution in height, right? And so what he did is, you know, um, he went to OkCupid. And so OkCupid actually is a, it's a, it's a dating page that's free. And so the data, you know, the, the deal in some sense is the data becomes available uh, for researchers. And um, so he looked at all the, you know, this is great, right? Because people actually put in their height and all this stuff. And uh, the agenda, so he, he just looked at men, and he, you know, collected all, you know, from tens of thousands of, of men, uh, their height, and then he plotted it. And distribution looks great, right? It looks like this. It looks like this. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's odd. <laughs> what's going on here? And does anyone know what's, what's here? It's six feet. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's six feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so apparently people who are five foot 11 <laughs> generously round up. <clears throat> Which is interesting, actually. It's like, <clears throat> it frustrates me a little bit because I'm exactly six feet and I feel like I'm, I'm you know, people are kind of, <clears throat> I'm not, you know, I guess that the recommendation for ladies is, you know, to, you can trade off one inch, right, and get someone who's really honest, right? If someone five foot eleven, that's a that's an honest guy. So, or if you want a tall pike, you know, then maybe go for six foot two or something. Anyway, but this is Gaussian distributed. Another one is another thing is IQ. IQ is Gaussian distributed. Actually, people have also done that experiment where they ask people, "What's your IQ?" And that also looks nothing like Gaussian, actually. <coughs> The average, average person has a way above average IQ, <coughs> according to self-reports. <coughs> but, so the reason that many, many things are uh, Gaussian distributed is because of the central limit theorem. So, uh, who's heard of the central limit theorem? I'll prove it. Okay, beautiful. So let me just show you, I made a little demo where I can actually show the central limit theorem. So central limit theorem says something very simple. It says if you have any distribution that has finite variance, so that's most distributions. Um, wait, uh, yeah, here we go. That's what I want. Then, if I then sample multiple points and average them, this average becomes Gaussian distributed. And so I thought, well, let's test this if it's true. <clears throat> so here's my demo. And so here's, here's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I have a distribution, and right now it's a uniform distribution. So, so here's a uniform distribution. So I sample points from this distribution, and I have basically a die that has, you know, can I take 10 values? Oh, uh, um, can I take on 10 values? And each of these 10 values is equally likely. So I draw samples from this and average them, and then I look at the averages. I do these averages multiple times. And if I do two averages, uh, sorry, I, I take, I, 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 I average two values and do that many, many times, this is the distribution that I get. And if I average four values and so on, and if I average 100 to 256 values, you see this is a perfect Gaussian distribution. Right, so here on the right. right? Despite that this here looks nothing like Gaussian. And now, now we can see, like, you know, does this really hold? We can try to break it, right? Let's try to make this distribution look really non-Gaussian, right? So, for example, let's make a lot of probability mass here, a lot of probability mass here. Right? So that's, that's the opposite of a Gaussian, right? You have, like, you know, nothing in the middle, but everything on the, on the, on the, on the outside, right? You can even set this to zero, right? Like, you know, let's really get rid of these things. Oh, I just broke it. I made it negative, but that doesn't work. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. I can't make it negative. All right. Let's make these really, really large. Okay, good. <clears throat> so now I've, I've, I've basically nothing left, right? And what you see here is like, when you have few samples, right? It doesn't look Gaussian. 
But as you actually get more, more examples, like even with this crazy distribution, which is really odd, right? You're either one or ten, right? You're never in the middle, right? The, the mean actually becomes Gaussian, right? <clears throat> and so I guess that means if you, you know, in, in real world, if there's something that depends on the average of many random variables, right? For example, your height, right? What does your height depend on? On your genes, right? On your, you know, what you eat, right? Uh, well, I don't know what else, but you know, uh, <laughs> probably many things. <laughs> and uh, uh, these are, you know, these are it's basically the, your, the, your height is, you know, in some sense an average of many factors, right? So it tends to be Gaussian distributed, right? Um, another place that people use a lot of Gaussian distribution is actually in the stock market, right? So the stock going up and down, you know, people make a lot of money predicting this, but there's also many, many factors that factor into this. So, and you don't really know what those are, but you know you know they're roughly Gaussian, right? So that's actually, that's, that's your angle, right? Because you know the distribution, you can actually attack it. <clears throat> okay, any questions about this demo? <laughs> so is n the number of samples you're taking or the size of your piece? n is actually the number of uh, uh, values that I'm averaging, and then I take many, many averages. Okay. And I think my notes may have a mistake there. I'm going to correct it on the... So yeah. <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Okay, here comes the beautiful thing, right? So one thing we have is that many distributions, like if, if random variables are the averages of many other things, many factors, they tend to become Gaussian, right? But that's not enough to explain why we see so many Gaussians in the real world. Right? There's a second thing. The first thing is things become Gaussian as we average them. And there's a second thing. The second thing is the Gaussian is the black hole of distributions. Once you're Gaussian, you stay Gaussian. Right? You can't escape. Right? Like if you add up two Gaussians, they stay Gaussians. If you multiply two Gaussians, they stay Gaussians. If you condition on one variable, it stays Gaussian. Right? If you marginalize something out, it stays Gaussian. Right? So it's kind of this attractor, the sinkhole. Right? You're stuck in it. And uh, that's a very, very important property that we will take advantage of. Actually, I make a little demo. Like, actually, in the past, I've actually proven all these things, that it's kind of closed under all these different operations. I, I thought maybe that's a little boring. So, so let, let, me, let me instead, I just had a meeting, actually, a faculty meeting. So during that, I secretly made that demo. <laughs> I hope none of my colleagues watch this video. But <laughs> um, uh, here we go. So here's, here's the first Gaussian demo. Okay, good. So here's the first thing I want to say. It's like, it's a, I take two different Gaussians. These are two variables, x and z. So x and z, so it's like I'm just drawing points from this distribution. And I'm drawing points from this distribution. This is my x, this is my z. Now I want to look at two new distributions. The first one is x plus z, and the second one is x times z. Where do you think these two will lie? Uh, maybe I give you a minute to discuss it with your neighbor, and think about where will x plus z, and where will x times z be?
All right, any guesses? Where is x plus z? Who wants to guess? Who wants to describe where x plus z is? Well, it's gone. All right. Black hole, that's right, that was it. <laughs> any guesses? Where is x plus z? Yes? It's, it's around zero, that's right. It's kind of between these two, right? And maybe a little wider than the blue one. And um, let's see it. Here we go, right? Well, it's not exactly centered around zero because this guy, they're not actually exactly symmetric. So this guy's a little further off, right? Because it has more variance, right? <clears throat> but you can see it's a beautiful Gaussian distribution, right? So what I'm doing is, in some sense, I take a sample value here, a sample value here, and add them up, right? So that's it's going to lie somewhere here in the middle, right? Where is x times z? Any guesses? Uh, I ignore you guys because you answer, you answer too many questions. <laughs> Say is a compliment. Uh, yeah? Sorry? Minus 20, minus 30 in here? Uh, yeah. Oof. Uh, right, so it's, it's, yes, it's here, but actually the spread is much, much wider, right? So here the variance, here's, this mostly affects the mean, right? But if you multiply them, right, if you, you could actually get a large, large negative value here, a large positive value here, that could give you a very large value, right? You could have minus 10 here, plus 10 here, that could give you a value of minus 100, right? So this is a very spread out uh, distribution. <clears throat> um, okay, so the important properties that I want to go over today that we will take advantage of is that the Gaussian distribution is, is closed under four, four uh, operators. The first one, um, well, normalization. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting, actually. It's like, it's already normalized. Um, so it sums to one. Well, that's, that's a trivial one. Um, the second one is, actually, let me just bring up the course notes. Because I, I, afterwards, I'm going to show you the demo again in two seconds. So there's no point going to the blackboard. OK, here we go. So. So we have this first thing. The second thing is marginalization. So what does that mean? If we have a, uh, sorry, the, the one thing we looked at, let's just do them out of order. Summation, so summation we've just seen. Let's say we have two distribution. The first one is y and y prime. They're both Gaussian. Then if I sum them up, y plus y prime becomes a new Gaussian distribution where I sum up the two means and I sum up the two variances, right? So that was the green thing in the middle of the red and blue, right? So the mean was kind of in the middle, and the variance is get a little, you know, the variance get a little wider, which is exactly what you said. <clears throat> then we have two more, marginalization and conditioning. So what does that mean? Marginalization means if I have two different, if I have a Gauss distribution over two values, right? And now I marginalize one of them out. So I have, you know, P of, what do I call them here? Um, YA and YB. Y A and Y B, and that's a two-dimensional Gaussian, right? Then if I, if I now compute the probability of P of Y A, what is that? Well, that's the integral over Y B, P of Y A, comma Y B, Y B, right? So that is again a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so if I have a high-dimensional Gaussian distribution, and I take any one of the dimensions and basically collapse it, right? So well, I have a demo, I can show it to you. If I basically sh take all the mass in one, one, one dimension and just sum them all up, squeeze them together, what's, what I get back is a Gaussian distribution. Um, let, let me show it to you. See, it was a large, it was a long faculty meeting, so I actually, it's multiple, multiple demos. So this here is a two-dimensional Gaussian, right? So you have x1 and x2, and this here is the heat maps that I've been drawing on the whiteboard all along, right? So, Imagine this, for example, this could be 
you know, um, you know, I will get to this example later on, but I've mentioned this in the past, you know, housing prices, right? So let's say I want to sell my house, right? But my neighbor has basically the same house in the same street, and if my neighbor is, let's say, is x1, I'm x2, right? So uh, uh, these are correlated in this case, right? So you look at this distribution, what you see is that if the value of x1 goes up, the value of x2 also goes up. I can actually make you a 3D plot. Here's a 3D plot. So now you can see very nicely, right? They're basically saying the value of one affects the value of the other, right? So these two are tied together, okay? And this is a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And if I now marginalize it, what am I doing, right? Let's say I want to know the value of x2. I don't care about x1. I don't care about my neighbor's house, right? You know, I want to sell my own house, right? So what I have to do is I have to sum up over all the possible prices that my neighbor could, could um, sell his or her house for. And I can show you uh, how this works. So let's say I now do this and I, okay, wait one second. So here, this is just the same thing on a different scale. Um, and now I, I, I'm summing up all the, all the different columns. So I'm just summing up, summing up, summing up, summing up, summing up, summing up, carry it all the way to the end. And what do I get? Ta-da! Right? Right here it is. This here is the Gaussian distribution. <laughs> right? You always stay Gaussian, right? That's the beautiful thing. We will take advantage of exactly that property later on. Let me do Gaussian processes. <clears throat> okay, so the, the last thing that, that the Gaussian distribution is... is um, the last operator that we can do is conditioning, right? This one here. And conditioning says, if I have a two-dimensional Gaussian, and now I, I know the value of one, one of the values, the second one stays Gaussian. So going back to the example of, the, of the, uh, my house and my neighbor's house, right? There's some Gaussian distribution that says, you know, they're tied together, right? And now my, my neighbor moves and sells her house, right? Well, that now affects the price of my house, but it remains Gaussian. So this is basically the following. I have a Gaussian distribution of YA, uh, YA and YB, and now I know the value of YB. That's my neighbor. Right? That's no longer uncertain. There's no distribution anymore. That now, that random event now happened, right? My neighbor sold her house. It's done, right? And now, what I can do now, I can take this information and compute the distribution over the remaining you know, random variable for which I don't know the value yet, yA, right? And that changes. And so, if you compute that, and that's the good old, you know, it's basically the joint distribution divided by the marginal distribution over yB, right? This is just good old uh, stats 101, right? Uh, turns out that becomes a Gaussian distribution, and here's the, the variable. It's basically the mean here plus this term, plus this term, and we will get, I will explain this in a minute. Let me show you a little demo. So here's the, the conditioning. So here's again our Gaussian distribution. And so, once again, you can see that, you know, just want to highlight the fact that we have this structure here, right? This structure here shows that these two are correlated, right? If x1 goes up, I mean, if you see in the 2D, if x1 goes up, x2 also goes up, right? So if my neighbor sells her house, you know, for a large price, that means my house is probably also worth a lot more, right? Um, and now what I can do is I can now condition on something. So I can now say, well, let's say my, by the way, this is now, these are, of course, these are not house prices, right? These go from minus one to six or something. But imagine I just say, well, it, the house is, uh, you just remove the average house in Ithaca or something, right? So then you could say, are you selling below average price or above average price? So now I can say, okay, well, she now sells her house at a certain price. This is the price, right? And what happens is the probability mass of everything else got sucked into this, right? That disappeared. This can no longer happen. This is probability zero now, right? All the probability mass ends up here. And essentially, all I'm doing is I'm renormalizing. <coughs> and what I'm getting is, you know, the Gaussian distribution. One thing that's really cool is I can now actually say, well, what happens if she sells a, price for a house for a different price, right? Then 
you know, so let's say I'm, I'm, I'm moving the value of x, x, x1, that changes the distribution of x2, right? So this here is the x distribution of x2, okay? And it happens at a particular value on x1. So this is conditioned, given that my neighbor sold her price for exact, a house for exactly this value, this here is now the distribution that I get for my house, right? And one thing I can now do is I can say, well, what if she sells a house for a different value? How does that affect my, my, my price, right? And I can now move around, right? And what you see is that the Gaussian shifts, right? The Gaussian shifts around, and if you look at x2, what's happening, right? The more valuable her house gets, right? The more valuable my house gets, right? So as her house becomes more expensive, this goes up to six, my house also is more likely that I, you know, to be worth that much money, okay? Any questions about this demo? Yeah? So it looks like the variance stays rather constant. Is it just for this particular case? Uh, the variance for this thing, yes, uh, does stay pretty constant. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's just for this case. Yeah. Um, one thing I can do now, I can actually show you another example. What if we, what if we, my neighbor actually wasn't my neighbor, right? What if my, you know, for example, instead of my, my wife tells me, oh, by the way, my, you know, our neighbor sold a house, and that's going to affect our house, right? So, um, what if instead, actually, uh, Steve Ballmer, right, or Bill Gates sells his house, right? So, Bill Gates has a house in Seattle. It's worth, you know, $50 million. That's a little more than my house. And... <laughs> And essentially what happens when he sells his house, there's absolutely zero impact on the price of my house, right? Because totally different people buy these houses, right? There's, they have nothing in common, right? The number, you know, I probably, he has, he has more bathrooms than I have rooms in my entire house, like, you know, by a factor of 10 probably. So, <clears throat> um, the Gaussian distribution would look different, right? It would look like this, right? So, um, Basically, you know, there's not, if x1 goes up, well, x2 kind of stays the same, right? There's still some probability mass that's kind of here in the center that says that, you know, there's still something, you know, some point that more is most likely depending on what x1 sells for and x2 sells for because, you know, Bill Gates' house may only sell for a certain, you know, it's probably it's reasonably likely to sell here, but it could also sell for that much or for that much. It won't affect my house price at all. And I can show you this. If I now look at the, the conditional distribution, what you see is that basically, you know, this distribution doesn't change at all, right? It just moves around, right? So if I look at the, the, just the view of my house, like the fact that, that Bill Gates changed, sold his house has no in fact, I, 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 impact on my house at all, right? And so the way I encoded this is in, the, in this matrix here. So this here is the covariance matrix. So Gaussian, two-dimensional Gaussians basically have a covariance matrix where, um, the diagonal entries, the two and the one, show you how, what the variance of each particular entry is. So this here would be, you know, what is the uncertainty about my house? What is the uncertainty about Bill Gates' house? And this value C says how correlated are they, right? How much does my house inform me about Bill Gates' house and vice versa? And so the first example, I set this to one, I believe. This constant C was one. And the second example, I set this to zero. Basically said they have nothing to do with each other. So, um, the Gauss distribution is very, very neat in that way that you can basically, you know, connect different random variables with each other in a very obvious way. Let me stop here, and if you get a little time, maybe read through these notes. It helps a lot um, to understand what we will be doing on Friday. <laughs>